can't, you adorable simpletons. But you can hear some great radio on the Rainier Avenue Radio app. It's brand new, it's free, and it's available for Android and iPhone. In fact, you can download the Rainier Avenue Radio app right now from the Google Play Store or the iPhone App Store. I'm going to go give me a smartphone right now. I'm just going to put a graduation cap on my rotary phone. <laughs> you two have very significant personal issues. Get the Rainier Avenue Radio Dot World app today. There's a lot going on. Are you ready? Ready to feel better? Look better? Be better? Drink water. Be ready for a pickup game. Insta frame to work hard towards your aim. Drink water. Hydrate. Hydrate to invest in yourself. Cut down on sugar. Invest in your health. Imagine the possibilities and reach your potential. Who knows what's next? Be ready. Be hydrated. This is Rainier Avenue Radio. World. I'm not sure why this is. Oh, there is it. There's the. Justice Gonzalez? Yes. Okay, I see you now. But the screen is uh, is uh, vertical. Um, yeah. Yours is to me, mine is right for me. I'm not sure why. Right. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see how this works. Uh, Dan, can you can you flip my screen and Justice Gonzalez screen to make it right? Can you hear me? Okay, I'm not sure why this is. Uh... It doesn't bother me. It's all right with me. All right. Which screen so I can see you? Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rainier Avenue Radio, and you are on Afternoons with Monique. Uh, on the show today, I have Justice Gonzalez, who is a Supreme Court, an, an on-the-bench Supreme Court uh, Justice uh, of Washington State. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I, um, uh, the format of the show, as you know, I'd like to introduce you to the audience and get a little bit of your background and learn a little bit about what you're working on right now and how your career had um, pan out in the last uh, 30 plus years um, of practice. So would you uh, share with us, uh, where were you born? I was born in Pomona, California, Southern California. Okay. And... Um, uh, tell me a little bit about your parents, a background, and your siblings. Uh, what were they doing? What did they do when you were growing up? How big is your family? Yeah, well, I'm one of three. I'm the middle child. Uh, I was the first in my immediate family to go to college, let alone law school. Uh, my father was in carpentry, and my mother was a, a vocational nurse, and uh, um, I decided to go to college and went to college in uh, Southern California at a small private school and majored in East Asian studies and had the chance to live in both Japan and China as part of those studies. Um, so you, you, you have two siblings and you're the first to go to college. Um, what did your siblings end up uh, working uh, as a career? Uh, my uh, older brother or was in uh, city uh, maintenance. So he worked in the parks department for a local city. And my my sister was in sales and uh, now works with uh, a pharmaceutical company. 
Okay, so just very, um, uh, I would say, middle class working family um, that you were growing up in. Is that right? I see. Yeah, because that's I, true. Yeah, that's uh, true. I always imagine justices must have come from, uh, you know, well off, very highly educated family. And clearly you are from the people kind of, the, the, you know, the very, um, you know, very uh, ordinary upbringing. Were you always the smartest guy in school? No, never was. Oh, really? <laughs> I see. <laughs> All right. Um, and you've got, you, you're only in your early 50s, so your career and your road to the Supreme Court justice, uh, uh, justice system or the Supreme Court is, uh, I would, I imagine has had been very smooth. Can you share a little bit about your progress, how you, you know, go from college, design a law career and became a lawyer, et cetera. I, I read your bio, but would you share with the audience that? Well, thank you for imagining that it was smooth. <laughs> I, I started off in college, majored, as I said, in East Asian studies. I, I did some graduate work in economics in between uh, and then went to law school and started my career in international business law, which I thought is what I wanted to do. I found that I didn't enjoy it as much as I imagined. And I started doing uh, work in courtrooms through volunteer work. And so I left the private firm and started doing domestic violence prosecution. And I did mostly the elder abuse and child abuse cases for the city of Seattle. Uh, and then was recruited to the US Attorney's Office where I prosecuted a variety of kinds of cases. I, I did the child prostitution cases, uh, the hate crimes for the Western District of Washington, uh, a high profile international terrorism case and a variety of other kinds of cases before I was invited to apply for appointment in Superior Court and Governor Locke, former Governor Locke appointed me to a vacancy uh, almost 19 years ago now, uh, where I then had to stand for election and served for 10 years in Superior Court. And it's now, I'm now in my ninth year on the Supreme Court. Wow, and uh, I understand that you get reelected every six years or so? Yes, so it's, a, it's a six year term. The, Initial election was immediate after appointment, but after winning a full term, it's every six years. So are you friends and socializing with your, the ju your fellow justices off the bench? Yes, some, some of us uh, spend more time together than others, but uh, yes, we've got uh, some great folks on the court. Uh, we like each other very much, despite disagreeing uh, vociferously sometimes on cases, but we, we, we do have great affection for each other as well. Um, when you come across cases, uh, I, I sometimes wonder uh, how often do you use your head versus your heart when you ruling a case? I know lawyers tend and, and justices are expected to, to use their logical side of their brain more than the emotional side or the compassion side. Uh, can you tell us about the conflict, if there is any, when you come across those kind of cases? Well, I hope that in every case we're using our heads. I, I hope also that we're informed by our hearts, that we understand that what we do has real consequences and it should move us to think carefully about the case, to think not just about the outcome, but how we write it, how we describe what happened, how we talk about the people who are affected. I think both heart and mind play a part in crafting a, a reasonable ruling that gives careful guidance, not just in the case before the court, but for future cases as well. One second, I just got instruction from the, tech, from the technical guy to turn my cam camera to the right, or is it turning, rotating to the right? I'm not sure what he meant, but it's on the screen. Who? I'm sure he'll clarify for me. All right. Okay. Um, I'd like to find out a little bit about uh, how, what you think when you see on the news, um, the situation at job, uh, well, no, no longer, but when it was going on and all the protests against police brutality and uh, the violence that goes on in the community, um, what kind of thoughts go across your mind? I think there are lots of 
strong feelings that have built up. And I think that the stay at home orders have affected how people are reacting to these things now as well. It's important that we examine our institutions and how they touch the rest of us. Uh, and specifically now to understand how those institutions might be perpetuating bias and disproportionality and to do everything we can to be honest with ourselves about who we are, who we've been and who we hope to be. So as a justice and you are the head of you, one of nine that are the head of the judicial system, uh, what do you see your role in how you can help rectify or remedy the current uh, unrest, civil unrest and um, dis disobedience, as well as addressing, well, I'll get to the police in a second, but you know, the civil unrest that is going on in the country and specifically in Washington state. Well, we don't have a direct role in addressing it as it's happening. Uh, sometimes there are cases that are brought. The one I'm thinking of was in federal court where a federal court judge, a trial court judge, uh, imposed an injunction on the Seattle, the city of Seattle regarding the methods that they could use on the crowds. So a court can be involved that way when parties bring a lawsuit and then we have to weigh uh, the law and the facts and, and issue a decision. For, for us, I think what it prompts is a renewed vigor in addressing who we are and what our court rules mean. It might mean reevaluating how we ensure access to justice to everyone, how we make sure that we're recruiting diverse people into the profession of the law, and particularly as judges, how we listen to each other more carefully and examine how we're doing things to make sure that we're not uh, unintentionally perpetuating the problem. Right. And as far as the police uh, uh, and their treatments of the people that cause uh, the social unrest and the, um, the, the dis disobedience as well as protest. Um, how do you see your role in, if you, if, if at all, I mean, I know the Supreme Court is a far reach, not a, a stone throw away from the police department, but um, your decisions affect, has a, a, a huge impact on how uh, the eventuality of um, these lawsuits against the, the police department uh, from the wrongful deaths. How do you see your role in, and I know some of these are federal cases and not, uh, and not uh, um, uh, Washington state, but do you see cases of this type coming up in, in, in front of you, before you? Many of the cases that we review on the criminal side pose the question to the state, did it exercise its authority lawfully? Uh, and so we're asked those questions. Did the, the police uh, follow the rules and get a warrant when it was required? Was there an exception? Uh, were civil rights violated by the way they conducted themselves? Uh, so we're, we're the ones who decide in a given set of circumstances and facts uh, whether they acted appropriately. Uh, and we hope not just to be talking about the facts in the case, but to making clear rules about how the police should conduct themselves and how individual members of the community should conduct themselves when, when interacting with the police. I see. Um, do you think that you, uh, as a Supreme Court of Washington, uh, are able to influence, uh, how, how strong is that influence uh, and set example and, and perhaps even put pressure on the police to uh, do right by the people? Well, I hope that our opinions are clear. We have certainly said uh, you have to announce yourself when you show up at someone's home. You have mm -hmm. to explain that they have a right to refuse you entry uh, before mm -hmm. you uh, request to go into someone's home. But we have, as a court, ruled that random stops on the freeway without a particular suspicion are unconstitutional under the state constitution. The Washington Constitution provides more protection for individual uh, liberty than the federal constitution does. And our court has clearly said that, and it has certainly had an effect on how law enforcement uh, does their business. I see. Uh, earlier, you touched on the access to justice. So I'd like to explore that subject for a second. Um, sure. I know you, yes, um, I know that you were 
on the board of the Access for, to Justice and were um, the the chair or the, is that right? The chair for the this board? Yes, I was the chair. Okay, so in your role as uh, the chair and the member of Access to Justice, and can you share with me and the audience um, what it is role and what are some of the activities that you've done to um, allow uh, you know, access to justice for the people? No, thank you. I, I was on the Access to Justice Board before I became a Supreme Court Justice. In fact, it was the Chief Justice, uh, former Justice Alexander, who appointed me uh, to that board. Uh, and it's a board that was created by the state Supreme Court. And the point of the board is, is to help improve uh, access by uh, folks to the courts to make sure that they know how to file a case, uh, how to fill out a form, to look for help if they need help and not to have uh, barriers and to make sure they have interpreters when they need interpreters, uh, et cetera. So we work very hard to uh, identify what the problems are and then to make proposals uh, to fix those things. One of the things that we did was called the Plain Language Project where we hired a consultant uh, to help the lawyers write in understandable language so that the forms then could be translated into other languages. Because if you start with a complicated form in English, uh, it's much more difficult to translate it into another language that will be clear to the user. So we were successful in uh, rewriting all of the family law forms, the mandatory forms for the state of Washington into plain language. So that's one example of a project that we undertook. I see. Earlier you mentioned um... Uh, that you were uh, on the board of uh, interpreter, interpreter commission, not the board, but the com interpreter commission. Yes. And I used to be a sort of a, a, an interpreter in my past, and uh, but that was many years ago. And today, I, I I I'm still in touch with some of my fellow interpreters, and I uh, I see that the pay is uh, fairly. Uh, abysmal comparing to the cost of living and the other intellectual uh, that are very competitive. For example, when I was doing interpreting work, uh, I was paid probably about the same as an, uh, an engineer graduate, new grad uh, at the UW. But today, I think the, 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 uh, char the charge that they were able to uh, bill is about probably half of what an hourly rate an engineer or maybe 60% is the the, the uh, compensation that interpreters get are not um, as lucrative as other intellectual professionals? Uh, do you th do you have any role or any uh, authority in in uh, advocating for that profession? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, just in the last session, the interpreter commission was part of a, a group uh, pushing for increased funding for interpreters throughout the state of Washington, and we we succeeded in getting over two million. Uh, more dollars from the state fund to reimburse local courts for uh, hiring interpreters to assist people who need them in court. And we'll continue that advocacy. I think it's important, it's critical that interpreters be paid well so that we can uh, recruit and encourage top-notch interpreters to assist people in court when they need them. Absolutely, and I think that is part of the access to justice because immigrants and refugees sometimes are at a disadvantage to receive quality interpretation in order to receive a fair trial. So I think it's very important that, you know, part of access to justice that the interpreter get paid, compensated fairly so that the talents won't leave the profession and left with just, you know, mediocre workers and uh, the litigants uh, who can't speak the language would not receive adequate um, uh, service. So- I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Um, um, some of my friends who are uh, attorneys wanted to ask you this question. Um, can you tell us what the Sixth and the Seventh Amendments are? Well, you, you're wondering about right to counsel? Um, this has to do with the case load that was uh, stuck in superior courts and, and lower courts. Mm -hmm. um, and I mentioned that right now the uh, jury um, system or the uh, yeah the jury system which is afforded to litigants via the sixth and the seventh 
amendments are being waived uh, because courts are uh, or superior courts are doing bench trials only. Um, and they're talking about uh, having a larger room so that everyone can stay six feet apart. And uh, how do you see this worked out? Well, there's no doubt that there's tension between wanting to give people the right to a speedy trial, which they're entitled to uh, by, by a jury of their peers and the desire to keep people safe from contracting uh, COVID. Uh, I'm not sure that there's the, a right way to resolve it. Uh, we have competing interests. The more trials we have, the more people are gonna be exposed and contract the disease. Right. The longer we delay, the longer people might be held in custody if they're not on release on bail. Uh, and their liberty is being curtailed and some of them might eventually be inevitably will be acquitted uh, or found not guilty so it's it's critical that we address this and that we do it in a thoughtful way so right now uh, each court is deciding uh, how to proceed the the supreme court we issued orders directing courts to suspend jury trials we now have reauthorized the resumption of those trials with specific guidelines to keep the jurors, the litigants, the staff safe, or at least as safe as possible. Uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, right now, you, you can proceed more easily if you waive a jury trial, but the court can't make you waive your right to a jury. If you demand one, you're entitled to have a, a jury trial before you can be found. Uh, oh, I see. I see. Um, the, the, uh, the role of the Supreme Court is sometimes eluding the average person. What kind of cases do you uh, look at and how, how many cases do you look at a year? Well, as you pointed out before, we're the highest court for the state. Uh, and when we decide cases based on state law, there is no other appeal. That's the end of, of the case. Uh, we hear cases that come to us from the Court of Appeals and before that from the superior court or district and municipal courts throughout the state of Washington. And we hear criminal cases and civil cases, family law cases, juvenile law cases, and we also do attorney discipline when there are <clears throat> allegations that lawyers have broken the rules of conduct that they're required to follow when they're licensed to practice law in the state of Washington. So uh, we do everything from murder, assault, property damage, contract disputes, malpractice cases, uh, et cetera. I see. Um, can you uh, share with us some uh, quick, briefly, uh, an example of an interesting case that you've had? Well, we, we've had a series of cases that have to do with the amount of money you pay for your car tabs or to renew your license every year. And there's one mm -hmm. pending before us uh, now. We hear... Uh, cases that are very complicated. We have heard uh, death penalty concerns and we found the death penalty unconstitutional as disproportionately affecting uh, people of color. Uh, and we've heard uh, other cases such as a case about whether uh, a riding lawnmower is a motor vehicle for purposes of uh, car theft statutes. Uh, and after we decided that a riding lawnmower is not a motor vehicle for purposes of automobile theft, uh, we heard another case about a snowmobile and found that a snowmobile is an automobile for purposes of motor vehicle theft. So if you steal a snowmobile, you can be charged with theft of an auto. If you steal a riding mower, you're just charged with theft. And these are different categories uh, of, of uh, punishment and you could get a misdemeanor versus a felony. Depending on the value of the riding mower. That's right. It's because the legislature passed a statute that said it's a felony to steal a motor vehicle, but they didn't define what a motor vehicle is. So necessarily these questions come up. Does it matter if it needs to be licensed to go on the highway or if you need a license to drive it or if it's for transporting passengers or if it has four wheels or three or two? There are all kinds of different ways to define it, but since the legislature didn't, we have to interpret that law when it comes to us. I see. Um, the, uh, another question I have is uh, the three branch of government, uh, because I see there are um, competing interests in different branch, like for example, you know, the police department, uh, I sometimes wonder, so who's supposed to keep them 
uh, you know, to drain them in, to, uh, to keep them accountable. Um, so every br which branch of government do you think have the most authority or the, you know, influence on the, the police uh, of Washington state? Yeah, well, that's very interesting because within the state, there are all kinds of law enforcement officers. You have federal enforcement officers from a variety of agencies. You have state patrol, you have uh, Coast Guard, you've got FBI, you've got local sheriff and local law enforcement, and they may be established in different ways. Some sheriffs are elected, some of them are appointed, uh, and the authority over them might be the county council, the city council, the executive, the mayor. And then when they act in a certain way, if a lawsuit is filed, of course, the uh, courts decide whether they exceeded the authority that has been given to them. And the legislature can pass laws requiring them to do certain things or not mm -hmm. to do certain things. So each branch of government has a role and it's a, a very complicated tapestry of authority throughout the state. Right. So I see where the rubbers meet the road is when the lawsuit is being filed and the punish is being doled out by the judicial system. So I see the, the, the role of your um, branch very vividly, very obvious when um, verdict is being, uh, being uh, given out. Um, so I, I guess I, you know, I, I just want to see as an, a person of authority how you see that these problems that we, our state and city and also nation is having to deal with. Is there a more simple solution that you can share in the next few minutes uh, before we, our show end? Well, I think civics is really important. It's important that we all understand how our government works. And we, when we get a case that poses a question uh, that's difficult to answer, we describe it. We try to describe it carefully. And the lawmakers, that is the legislature right across the parking lot from our building here in Olympia, can read that case and say, oh, the court has pointed out a problem with the use of force by law enforcement that we need to fix. And they can pass a new law. And when they pass a new law, they should get input from the public. So you and anyone else can write to your lawmaker and say, I think there's a problem and here's what I think you should do about it. Uh, and if they're listening, they might study what you've proposed uh, and suggest new legislation to address the problems that exist. So these letter writings actually work? I mean, I heard people write letters, but I don't know if they actually get read or being considered. So you're saying they are being considered? Well, I think they make a big difference. I, I know that the legislature cares what the public thinks. Uh, and mm -hmm. when they hear from you, and if they hear from enough of you, uh, they're much more likely to take action. Very interesting. Um, we have a couple of minutes, last minutes. Uh, so what kind of uh, work are you working on uh, to educate the public with uh, the various programs that you spearhead? Well, this radio show is a big part of it. Thank you for having me here as your guest. It's a pleasure to of speak course. with you. Uh, I also speak to uh, civic groups throughout the state. I spoke to a Rotary Club in Central Washington yesterday. I was on a national seminar earlier. I'll be speaking to a Thurston County group this afternoon. Uh, I'm on another uh, American Bar Association call about implicit bias tomorrow. Uh, I speak in schools or I spoke in schools back when schools actually were in session with students meeting uh, on uh, government classes, on civics uh, and related topics. So I'm, I'm very active uh, and communicate often with the public. I think it's critical for everyone to understand what the court does and why we matter in a democracy. Very good. So we are, have reached the end of our show. You are on Rainier Avenue Radio, and this is Afternoons with Monique. Thank you so much, Your Honor, for coming on and for sharing with us uh, the role of uh, your branch of government, as well as educating me and the public uh, some of the work that you do and bring uh, a face and a name to the household and, and introduce us to and, and make us more aware of the various things that we can help to make our lives better. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Monique. I'll close by saying, please vote. There'll be two of my colleague justices on the ballot for you in November. Very good. Thank you for coming on the show. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.